From the Greenhouse, it's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 75, and as popular as franchise restaurants are in our world, you might be surprised to learn that franchising came very close to getting itself banned as a business model in the United States circa 1970. There was a public moral panic about franchising, and lawmakers still high on the fumes of the progressive era, were poised to act, for better or worse, to effectively ban a business relationship in which a big company, like McDonald's, sells the right to operate individual McDonald's locations to other people, traditionally local small business people. That's the business model undergirding more than half of the fast food restaurants we patronize here in the U.S., and it has spread the world over. Franchising might have been effectively regulated out of existence were it not for the formation of a huge, deep-pocketed lobbying group to represent the interests of franchisers, like McDonald's corporate. This group proceeded to play politicians like fiddles, and by the dawn of the 21st century, franchising was not only definitely not banned— it accounted for more than 10% of all private sector economic output in the United States, according to a study commissioned by said franchiser trade group. Franchising is here to stay, for better or worse. In this mostly historical episode, we're going to cover the birth of the modern restaurant franchise to its near death in the late 60s, early 70s, and into its heyday, which we're arguably still in. This will be the last in a little trilogy of fast food focused podcasts that we have done lately. When I was researching Dunkin' Donuts for last week's ep, I came across this quote about Dunkin's founder, William Rosenberg. This is from the biography of Rosenberg on the University of New Hampshire Library's website. The UNH Library holds Rosenberg's papers. So this is the bio that they have up there for him, okay? So, quoth the University of New Hampshire Libraries. In 1959, Rosenberg had the idea of starting the International Franchise Association while attending a franchising convention in Chicago. At the time, franchising was in its infancy and faced the threat of being legislated out of existence. End quote. I wondered what the heck that line was talking about, and this whole episode is going to be about what that line was talking about. I'm relying here mostly on a legal history of franchising that was written by the attorney William Killian, who edited the Franchise Law Journal for a long time. He's obviously a pro-franchise voice, so I have tried to take his more evaluative observations with a grain of salt. We're focusing more on the cut and dry history here anyway. What is a franchise? Well, historically, franchise is just another word for freedom. As is generally the case in English, if we have two words for exactly the same thing, Usually one is of Germanic origin via the Anglo-Saxons and the Frisians and such who came to England en masse between the 5th and 7th centuries. And the other word that we have that means the exact same thing is generally of Latin origin via the French-speaking Vikings called Normans who conquered England in 1066. Franchise and freedom or their etymological ancestors, probably meant about the same thing in 1066. They described a liberated status. A person or group with freedom or franchise would not be enslaved, or perhaps they'd be exempted from punitive taxation or from military conscription or other temporary forced labor. The word franchise comes from the French word for themselves, the Franks. The Germanic people who gradually wrested control of the Roman province of Gaul and renamed it after themselves, France. In the political context of early France, to call someone a Frank was to call them a free person, a person of the privileged ruling class, not a slave like everybody else. This dynamic lives on in the English language today, where we describe like real talk as being frank talk. I'm being frank 
if I'm being free in how I express my opinions. Frankness equals freedom because the Franks were the free people in the society that produced the word franchise. To enfranchise someone was to enfranchinate them, to give them the legal status of Franks in France, enfranchise, to legally Frankify someone. And in this historical context, to give someone the legal status of Franks would be to liberate them from slavery and to grant them some kind of citizenship with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. An enfranchised person may still be very low class. They may be at the bottom of the class structure, but at least they aren't below the bottom. An enfranchised person is part of the state or part of the realm or the empire or whatever it is. An enslaved person is under the state. An enfranchised person is part of the state. And historically, that has meant some reasonable expectation of private property rights, etc. And in more recent centuries, it has meant the right of a citizen to vote. We still use franchise that way in English today. It's the specific right that we have to vote in elections the franchise. When we disenfranchise people, such as when we in the U.S. deny people convicted of felonies the right to vote, when we do that, we are effectively kicking them out of the club. We're saying, you're no longer one of us, one of the Franks who run things around here. Whereas you used to be part of the community of the realm, now you exist beneath the realm. So that's how the word franchise entered the English language and why it was synonymous with freedom, the Germanic equivalent contributed to English centuries before by the Frisians. As is generally the case in these English synonym situations, the word of French origin gradually accumulated new layers of meaning due to its more prevalent use among the ruling class, which was French-speaking for centuries after the Norman Conquest. Due to its use in the halls of power, franchise came to be the word for freedom that we use when talking about a freedom bestowed by the crown or by the government, or in some cases the church, which was a transnational government seated in Rome. Because freedom was the word of the Germanic-speaking people that the Normans ruled over, freedom came to refer to those rights held by common people. And those rights are generally like natural rights or or rights that people would have thought of as flowing directly from God or directly from the constitution, etc., as opposed to rights bestowed on an arbitrary basis by the king or the pope. A natural right is the right to not have your property seized arbitrarily by the state without any compensation. It's the right to not be imprisoned or tortured or executed without cause and due process of law, etc. We came to think of those rights as freedoms because those are the rights held by the common people who spoke Anglo-Saxon and therefore would have called them freedoms. A right bestowed by the king might be the right to rule over all the land in this shire and to collect rent and conscript troops and workers in the name of the king. That's a franchise. A right bestowed by the king might be the right to collect taxes in the name of the king and to keep a 10% fee for yourself or whatever it was. That's a franchise. It might be the right to not perform otherwise mandatory military service, or it might be the right to not pay a tax that everybody else has to pay, or it might be a monopoly the exclusive right to provide ferry service on this section of the Thames or whatever. Because these are rights bestowed by the king on his friends, and because the king and his friends generally spoke Norman French, they naturally used the French word for freedom to describe these rights, franchise. As a result, a new dynamic emerged where we use freedom to describe rights that derive from the ultimate authority, nature, God, whatever you consider the ultimate authority to be, while we use franchise to describe rights that derive from a lower, more worldly authority like the state. In that sense, franchise has evolved to be more synonymous with privilege in English, a right that is not inalienable, but one that 
can be granted and taken away at the pleasure of some earthly authority like the government. That's a privilege, and that's a franchise in modern English. But here's the thing about free market economics. Tends to produce a whole lot of little kings. If you're a king ruling over a people and a territory, and if you let your people form companies to buy and sell things and to sail around the world and import and export things and to build factories to make things, etc. If you do that, if you allow your people to engage in what we would now call free enterprise, if you do that, you create new little kings who accumulate so much wealth and authority within the statelets of their little companies that they can and do ultimately rival royal authority. Companies are often like little states in the sense that the leaders of the company are able to exert near dictatorial control over their employees. When you, a worker, sign an employment contract, you are essentially relinquishing many of your natural rights and putting yourself under the authority of your employer. The biggest difference between a corporation and a state is the state can use its monopoly on organized violence to compel you to do what the state wants you to do, whereas all corporations can do to compel your behavior if they employ you is to threaten to fire you, because ultimately you have voluntarily placed yourself under the authority of this employer, and therefore you can remove yourself from that authority whenever you wish, at least in accordance with whatever contract you signed. So anyway, in the 19th century, United States specifically, During the rise of the robber baron era in the U.S., we start to see the word franchise being used to describe a right bestowed not by the government, but by a corporation or other private sector entity, because Henry Ford was like a little king. So when he granted a dealer the right to sell new Ford cars, it was kind of like a royal franchise. So they called it that a franchise, a right bestowed by one business upon another business in this case. That's what the word usually means these days in North America. It's a business relationship. No one knows who operated the first franchise business in the U.S., but some of the earliest noteworthy examples from the mid-19th century include the Singer Sewing Machine Company, and the McCormick Machine Harvesting Company, which became International Harvester. These companies made big, expensive machines, and they generally sold these machines to independent agents, middlemen, wholesalers, who would buy a hundred Singer sewing machines out of the back door of the factory and then take them into the city to sell Singer sewing machines to retailers or to consumers at a profit, right? Gradually, Singer started exercising some control over these independent agent wholesaler type people who were representing Singer's brand all the time, but who did not work for Singer. There were problems like independent agents not really understanding the sewing machines or how they work or how to repair them. Independent agents fighting over sales territory. You know, one agent goes into a general store and offers to sell sewing machines for slightly less than the other agent that also was trying to sell sewing machines to that same store. And this creates a downward price pressure that ultimately squeezes everybody out of business. So Singer developed a model where they would grant an individual sales agent exclusive rights over a territory. They would say, hey, we we at the Singer Sewing Machine Company, we will not sell any sewing machines to anybody other than you in the North Baltimore Territory. And in exchange for that, that franchise that we are giving you, in exchange for that, you will come to the factory and you will sit for a training course so you know how the machines work and how to sell them effectively, and you will sell them within a price range set by us, etc. And maybe we'll even float you a line of credit so that you don't have to come up with a big pile of cash to buy a hundred sewing machines. We'll just give you a hundred sewing machines and call it a loan that you'll repay with your profits, etc. So in that sense, You can see the modern business franchise relationship emerge organically in 19th century U.S. commerce. The reason the Singer salespeople didn't work directly for Singer was that they never worked directly for Singer. They were always just guys who hung around outside the Singer factory with a wagon and a pile of cash. 
The franchise relationship emerged as a way to formalize that link in the supply chain between the manufacturer and the retailer, wholesaler, consumer, all that. The retailer slash wholesaler cedes some of their rights to operate their business as they see fit in exchange for some special access from the manufacturer. This worked particularly well in the farm implement business, which required enormous local knowledge on the part of the salesman. The farm equipment business was highly seasonal. There's only one tiny sliver of the year when farmers would be thinking about buying a combine harvester and have the cash to do it. And the market was highly personal. To sell combine harvesters, you had to know what time of year to go into a given rural territory. You'd have to know which farmers don't already have a combine harvester, and you'd need to convince Luddite farmers of the value of a combine harvester. An integrated sales team directly employed by the McCormick Machine Harvesting Company probably could not do this. They'd have to live their entire lives on the road, moving with the seasons from one farming territory to another, and they would lack local knowledge once they got there. It made a lot more sense for McCormick to say, hey, Farmer John, you bought one of our harvesters last year. You seem to be enjoying it, and you seem to have a silver tongue for a farmer. So how about you try to sell our harvesters to your farmer friends and then we'll split the money with you. I mean, not evenly, of course, but we'll split the money with you some ways. And that's how McCormick ended up with a network of sales agents who were nominally independent, but who effectively worked for McCormick. In the late 19th century, General Motors and Ford and such adopted the same model for selling their cars. They contracted with independent sales agents called dealers who secured the right to sell new Ford cars by agreeing to do it Ford's way. That right is a franchise. Ford was the franchisor and the dealer was the franchisee. And so it remains to this day. But that's not really what we think about when we think about franchises nowadays. That specific kind of franchising that has become all but synonymous with franchising is business model franchising. That's a more specific thing. And it happens when one successful business owner, hopefully successful, it happens when one business owner basically sells their business model and all of their secrets to another owner who will replicate the first business at some different location. Basically, you sell your secret formula. If you have something that uh, you really need to keep a secret, consider connecting it to the internet with NordVPN, sponsor of this episode. Connecting to the internet through a virtual private network can make hacking virtually impossible. It's especially important if you ever use public Wi-Fi, like at a hotel or an airport or something, but VPNs are also useful for obscuring your physical location on the internet for safety reasons, or just so that you can keep streaming your favorite shows while you travel. Lots of online content is geofenced so that you can only access it from certain countries. A NordVPN allows you to virtually visit whatever country you want. Nord uses double encryption, where the second VPN server is unaware of the original IP address, and connections are made via both UDP and TCP protocols. With NordVPN, you get all the advantages of the Onion Router, like Tor you may have heard of, plus the added security of a VPN tunnel. It's Super important, super useful for getting around internet censorship in various countries or for getting around your ISP if they're like throttling your connection. Connect via VPN and you should be good. Get an exclusive NordVPN deal with my link in the description. It's nordvpn.com slash Adam Ragusea. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. nordvpn.com slash Adam Ragusea. That's in the description. Thank you, NordVPN. Anyway. The kind of franchising that we mostly see in the restaurant industry today is what's called business format financing, franchising rather. And an early example of that would be the Rexall drugstores. Druggists used to be more like doctors, albeit with much sketchier training. (laughs) They used to get their druggist license and then they would set up shop as an independent retailer in a business that resembled like the private practice of a physician. 
Druggists gradually banded together in cooperatives of various kinds to centralize and streamline their supply chains. A co-op of 20 druggists in Chicago could buy aspirin at a lower unit price than one druggist buying aspirin alone. The co-ops could also produce their own drugs centrally and then sell them through their individual independent stores. Eventually, successful druggists started opening second and third and fourth locations that became integrated chains as opposed to co-ops. Integrated chains owned entirely by one entity and still benefiting from economies of scale. That's how Charles Walgreen built his drugstore chain in Chicago in the early 20th century. In Boston... Justin Whitlock Dart was a graduate of Northeastern University who married Charles Walgreen's daughter and thereby became an executive in the Walgreen's company. Dart is credited with the idea of putting the pharmacy counter at the back of the store, both to provide a little privacy for sensitive conversations and also to force the customer to walk by rows and rows of tempting merchandise before they get to the drug counter. Walgreen's was a pioneer in offering non drug merchandise. They had their own ice cream factory for their malted milkshakes, for example. Then Justin Whitlock Dart divorced Ruth Walgreen and left the company. In 1943, he took control of the United Drug Company Co-op, and he rebranded all of the stores and much of the merchandise under the Rexall brand name that it already owned. Rexall prominently sponsored the Amos and Andy show and quickly became a household name. The Rexall model became one in which the company owned the brand name and the distribution system, and they either made or licensed a lot of the products, but the stores themselves were individually owned and operated by franchisees. This is a business format franchising example. Rexall was not just contracting with outside entities to sell their products. Rather, Rexall established a successful way of running a drugstore. A certain customer experience associated with a brand name that Rexall promoted through expensive national advertising. What Rexall offered franchisees was the right to start their own Rexall store under the Rexall brand name, selling Rexall products. You don't have to have any ideas of your own. You just have to put in the startup capital and the work. Another early example of business format franchising is the Harper Method Salons. Martha Matilda Harper grew up in domestic servitude in Ontario and later across the border in Rochester, New York. She developed particular knowledge in the hair and skin care world. She invented her own hair tonic, and she used her life savings to open a salon in Rochester to promote this hair tonic, which she called a gentle, natural alternative to harsh chemicals. Pretty forward-thinking marketing for 1888. She also hired lots of fellow former servants, and she trained them, and eventually she licensed another hairdresser to open a Harper Method franchise over in Buffalo, New York, and the chain spread from there. She mostly franchised the stores to other fellow lower-class women. Again, Franchisees weren't signing up to help Harper's business, but rather they were signing up to replicate Harper's business. That's the distinction with business format franchising. Early examples of franchising in the food industry include Coca-Cola, though that wasn't really business format franchising. That was more a system where Coca-Cola contracted with local business entities to bottle and distribute Coca-Cola. The company made the syrup, they sold the syrup to franchisees who would mix it with soda water per Coca-Cola's instructions and then bottle it and sell it to local retailers. Franchisees aren't really replicating Coca-Cola's business in that context, rather they're, they're just part of Coca-Cola's business. Where we see business format franchising emerge in the food industry is with fast food. Again, it's debatable slash unknown who was first, but I can find no earlier example than the roadside root beer stands operated in California's Central Valley by Roy W. Allen and Frank Wright, A and W. California was at the vanguard of this new, 
automobile-based lifestyle that we Americans have inflicted upon ourselves, and A&W Root Beer pioneered drive-in curbside service where a tray boy would serve you through your car window. In the mid-1920s, Allen bought out Wright and started franchising the business. But this was also not really business format franchising because all Allen really sold to franchisees was the right to say, sell a w root beer from the concentrated syrup that he made. Allen did nothing to standardize the food menus or the look of the stores, nothing. And that was understandable because he was not charging franchisees a percentage of total sales or anything like that. Roy Allen made money by charging franchisees a small one-time upfront franchise fee, and then he sold them his root beer syrup. He set up franchises basically to create customers for his syrup. That's not business format franchising. A customer could have a great experience at the a w in Stockton, but then have a completely different experience at the a w in Modesto or Bakersfield. Not great. If all you want to do is sell drink mix and not help run retail outlets, well, then really you're better off selling directly to, to like the consumer, which is the business model favored by Element, sponsor of this episode. Get a free sample pack with any purchase right now at drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Element is spelled L-M-N-T. Drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Element is a delicious electrolyte drink that can help you stay hydrated in hot weather or during extended exercise where you're sweating out all your salt. It's weird to think about salt deficiency in our French fry society, but acute salt deficiency happens all the time to athletes and such. When you run out of electrolytes, you lose control of your nervous system, and that's one reason you might get the shakes or go wobbly toward the end of the basketball game or whatever. That's why athletes used to take salt tablets, and now they drink sports drinks. Problem is, most sports drinks are filled with sugar. And that might be great for an athlete in competition who needs energy, but if I'm exercising for the express purpose of burning calories, I don't want to rehydrate with more calories. Element is sugar-free. Sweetened with stevia leaf, like 10 calories a serving. You just dissolve the powder in however much water you want. I love the grapefruit salt flavor, which is now permanent. It's not just a summer thing anymore. Mm. Drinks are tasty, really simple, natural flavors. And they have an evidence-backed ratio of sodium to potassium to magnesium to replenish the electrolytes that you're likely to lose through sweat or maybe through a super strict diet where you're not eating any fast food or anything. It would be easy in that situation to actually eat not enough salt. Then you might feel foggy and tired. They call that kind of thing like the keto flu. Try an electrolyte drink. Try Element. You can get a free, fla fr free flavor sampler. I got that out right. Yeah. You can get a free flavor sampler right now with any purchase at drinkelement.com slash Adam. Drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Thank you, Element. Anyway, back in the early days, A&W made money by selling their root beer syrup to franchisees. They did nothing to standardize the menu or the look or any other aspect of the customer experience across all of the many franchises. And that was a missed opportunity, at least early on when they did that. The great potential of a chain is to create a uniform experience that attracts travelers. The automobile boom in the United States created an explosion in travel. And unlike dining on a train or something where you're a captive audience and you just have to accept whatever they sell you, when you're driving, you can choose which roadside restaurant you stop at. So the great potential of a chain restaurant is to say to that driver, hey, buddy, I know you're not from around here and you don't know where the good places are, but look. Here's a perfect clone of your favorite restaurant from back home. Or maybe it's not your favorite. Maybe you hate it, but it's the devil you know. You know what you're getting into when you stop at this chain restaurant. And that was very appealing to a gigantic new class of automobile travelers in the United States. You know who understood early on that uh, standardization would be key? A guy who inherited a failing cigar business in Boston named Howard Deering Johnson. 
Cigarettes were coming in, cigars were going out. So Johnson sold his father's failed cigar shop in 1924 and bought a soda shop in Quincy, Mass. Excuse me, Quincy, Mass. The same suburban cradle of Dunkin' Donuts. Johnson introduced new, higher fat ice cream recipes that he made himself with hand cranks in his basement. And then he started selling burgers and hot dogs, and he opened a second location in Quincy. But he had two problems. One, incredibly long lines at his stores. A good problem to have. And two, the Great Depression, which was a bad problem to have. Johnson could not raise the necessary capital to open a third location and a fourth and a fifth, etc. So in 1935, Howard Johnson entered into a new type of business relationship with a family friend named Reginald Sprague. Reggie and his family got the money together to open their own Howard Johnson's restaurant in Orleans, Mass., which is on Cape Cod. Reggie cooked. His wife, Gladys, was the hostess, and their daughters waited tables. And even though they did not work for Howard Johnson, they followed Johnson's business plan and recipes to the letter because they knew Johnson's system worked. It had proven itself in Quincy. And then, when Howard Johnson's customers vacationed down on the Cape, to their delight, there was the Hojos they knew and loved from back home. The food and the ice cream was just as good. And most importantly, they knew what they were getting as they traveled. So yeah, that first Hojos franchise on the Cape was a huge hit. The Sprogs made enough profit in two years to pay off the initial $17,000 loan that they took out to start that store. And Howard Johnson got a new stream of revenue, the franchise fee the Sprogs paid to use Hojo's brand and recipes. There was no financial risk at all for Johnson, only potential reward. It was the Sprogs, the franchisees, who took on the financial risk of their own store. The Sprogs took out the loan, and the Sprogs put in the, el the elbow grease. They were owners, so they were motivated to put in that elbow grease. The more ice cream and hot dogs they sold, the more money they made because they owned the business, and they used their local knowledge and connections to drive sales. This is business format franchising in its best case scenario. It combines the scale, efficiency, and brand recognition of a national chain with the pride and purpose of small business ownership. People running their own stores are probably going to work harder and smarter than people who are just punching the clock for a faceless corporate overlord. Of course, the problem with franchising from the franchisor's perspective, from Mr. Johnson's perspective, Mr. Howard Johnson's perspective, the problem for his perspective is the lack of control. You know, you sell someone the right to represent your brand. And if they cut costs too deeply, or if they just suck at their jobs, or if they just have like a radically different vision for the brand, you have limited options to bring your franchisee to heel because they do not work for you. You cannot fire them. And yet they are doing business under your brand name and could ruin your brand's reputation by giving customers a non-standard experience. Howard Johnson per usual, was way ahead of things. He saw this control problem coming miles away. So one thing he did was continue opening up his own centrally owned locations called company stores. Howard Johnson preferred to own his own stores himself. He generally only resorted to franchising when he couldn't raise the necessary capital to keep up with his expansion plans. He'd be pouring over traffic maps, figuring out the exact right place in Danbury, Connecticut or wherever to build a roadside restaurant. But then he wouldn't have the liquid cash to open a store. So rather than let the location eventually go to a potential competitor, he would find a local franchisee. 
And Howard did a million other ridiculously smart things. He looked at demographic trends. He realized the baby boomer generation had just been born. Restaurants with kids' menus and booster seats would do very well for the next 20 years or so, so that's what he offered at his restaurants. And he expanded into lodging, helping to establish the concept of the motel, a roadside hotel that's convenient for motor vehicle travelers, and you're confident it's safe because it's got Howard Johnson's name on it. And, of course, Johnson established a uniform, orange-roofed look for all of his stores, which made them easily identifiable from all the way up on the highway. He wrote the Howard Johnson's Bible, they called it the Bible, an exhaustive handbook prescribing how a franchisee should run a Howard Johnson's establishment. And his lawyers wrote clauses into franchise agreements allowing Hojo's to take its name back from a franchisee that failed to uphold standards. The guy just kept winning and winning until he died in 1972, at which point the winning stopped. Howard Johnson had sent his son Bud to Harvard Business School, and he gradually passed the business over to his son. And Bud proved capable in his own way, but he seemed to be like the wrong leader for the times he was given. Hojo's faced tougher competition from cheaper fast food chains imitating their franchise model with simpler menus, and the 1973 oil crisis spiked the price of gasoline, which meant that people drove around a whole lot less in the United States, and so sales slumped. Bud Johnson had to do something to balance the books, and unfortunately what he did was cut food quality. I think right around the time my dad was scooping ice cream for a Howard Johnson somewhere. Hojo's became kind of an old-fashioned, stuffy place with bad food that still cost more than McDonald's, and so things went south, and Bud sold out in 1979 to Britain's Imperial Tobacco Company, which sold it in turn to competitor Marriott, which rebranded most of the remaining locations, and the last Howard Johnson's restaurant closed in 2022, last year. It was in Lake George, New York. It's gone. But some of the hotels remain, and the basic franchise model lived on. And on. And on. Another center of growth in the early restaurant franchise business was soft-serve ice cream. All ice cream starts off as soft ice cream. When you do the initial churn of your cream... In your milk and your sugar, in you know, very cold conditions, you churn it, you slowly create a whole bunch of tiny little ice crystals, and you whip in air as the mixture solidifies, and there, you've got soft ice cream. It is intoxic- intoxicatingly good, but it is ephemeral. In the open air, soft ice cream melts almost as fast as you can eat it. In the freezer... It converts into hard ice cream, the kind of ice cream you have to dose out with a specialized scooper that can cut through such a hard substance. That's the old-fashioned kind of ice cream that my dad scooped at Hojo's. Newfangled ice cream emerged in the mid-20th century as several inventors working on parallel tracks invented these machines that continuously churned ice cream, thus making soft ice cream continuously available. You just extrude one serving at a time out of the churning machine. It works as long as the customer eats it right then and there, so it makes sense for like a stand or a restaurant. Quickly, these new soft ice cream pioneers realized that you could make soft ice cream in these new machines with much less butter fat than you need for hard ice cream, which means you can use a cheaper mixture because cream is expensive, plus the lower fat mixtures arguably come out better from a soft serve machine, or maybe they're just cheaper and they convinced us that it's better. Problem is, ice cream is one of those basic products for which the U.S. government has established standards of identity that specify things like minimum butterfat content, which meant that these new soft-serve operators could not sell their product as ice cream. No worries, we'll call it something random instead, like, I don't know, Dairy Queen. We'll call it Dairy Queen or something. That's what J.F. McCullough and his son Alex figured when they invented their own soft-serve formula in 1938. They convinced a family friend named Sherb Noble to sell this new Dairy Queen substance from his ice cream shop in 
Kankakee, Illinois, and it was a massive instant hit, but it was all like hand scooped. They did not have those continuous freezer extruder machines yet. The McCulloughs had envisioned some kind of machine that would do that job, but they didn't know how to build it. Eventually, they found a guy across the state line in Hammond, Indiana, a guy named uh, Harry Oltz, who had designed one of the early continuous churn machines, and then they were off to the races. Under the agreement they hatched out, the McCulloughs would have exclusive rights to use and license the machine in Illinois and territories west, while Harry Oltz would have the rights in the east. And he would also get to use the Dairy Queen name and recipe, and he would also get a couple of cents for every gallon of mix sent through any one of his machines. But these were the war years in the U.S., you know, World War II. And there was not a lot of investment capital around to start businesses that were outside of the military industrial complex. And so Dairy Queen relied on franchising to fuel growth. And it was another Harry who really made that happen. Harry uh, Axine, I guess it'd be pronounced Harry Axine. Another guy who is sometimes called the father of franchising. Harry Axine was a farm implement salesman. That's how he learned about franchising. And what he did at Dairy Queen was sell territories, not individual franchises. He'd find a guy who could be like the territory operator for a set of counties in Wisconsin or wherever, and he would sell that guy the territory rights. And then that guy, the territory operator, would sell rights to individual franchisees who would open up their individual stores in that territory. This made things much simpler for Dairy Queen, and they could make a ton of cash fast by selling off the rights for a gigantic territory in one swoop. Harry Axine left the company and did it all again in 1950 with his new Tasty Freeze chain, immortalized by John Mellencamp in his song Jack and Diane. Johnny Cougar, as he was known at the time, is a son of Indiana. Indiana is right next to Illinois. And both Dairy Queen and Tasty Freeze emanated out of Joliet, Illinois, because Harry Axine. And I think that, like, walk up soft serve ice cream stands remain a a particularly Midwestern thing to this day. I mean, it exists elsewhere, but I think of it as a particularly Midwestern thing. Though, on the more populated and urbanized East Coast in the New York area, a Greek ice cream truck driver named Tom Carvel invented his own soft serve machines. And that's how a New Yorker like my dad grew up with at least some soft ice cream in a world It was a world away from like Mellon camp country where my mom was growing up. Carvel, Dairy Queen, and Tasty Freeze all used franchising to fuel their growth, but they generally did it by selling ice cream machines and the rights to use them. That's how they made money not by taking a cut of total sales or anything like that. They sold the machines and the rights to use the machines within a given territory. The problem with that model is that it gave them very little control over the franchisees. And so one Dairy Queen could be totally different and way worse or way better than the next Dairy Queen on the highway. Not a great situation. And when all you do is sell the freezers, you end up with market saturation problems. You've sold that franchisee all of the freezers he's going to need for the next five or 10 years. So how do you make money off of that location now? The business person who could combine the quality control of Howard Johnson's with the accessibility, simplicity, and low price point of a soft ice cream stand, that person would make themselves very wealthy indeed. And that is what Ray Kroc did. In 1952, American Restaurant Magazine ran a story about a then-unique walk-up burger restaurant in San Bernardino, California. It was a walk-up store that was designed, kind of ironically, for drivers. You would park your car, then walk up to the window and avail yourself of a self-serve system that would spit out a burger, drink, and fries for you in 20 seconds. That was the hook that the McDonald brothers had come up with. 
The article about them was read by lots of people in the business, including a middle-aged milkshake machine salesman from Illinois named Ray Kroc. He was making some sales calls in LA and he figured that he would drive an hour inland to check out this weird McDonald's place he'd read about and that was using some of the milkshake machines that he had sold. Kroc was impressed by what he saw. He had dinner with the McDonald brothers that very night. They had already sold a few franchises in California and Arizona, and they were looking for a knowledgeable industry veteran to franchise the concept back east because they weren't super sure if their like outdoor concept could work in cold weather cities like Chicago. Well, there was Ray Kroc from Illinois at their doorstep. Burger King and Wendy's and Carl's Jr. and Jack in the Box, these, they were all getting started around the same time. Ray Kroc was not the only guy doing what he did, but he was obviously the most successful. He was the McDonald Brothers designated franchisee for most of the U.S., if you're curious how he built McDonald's into the empire that it became, I highly recommend the 2016 book by my old public radio buddy, Lisa Napoli. It's called uh, Ray and Joan, the man who made the McDonald's fortune and the woman who gave it all away. She gave a lot of it to NPR, hence Lisa's interest. There's also the 2016 movie, The Founder, where Michael Keaton plays Ray Kroc. I don't love that movie, but man, I love Michael Keaton. Ray Kroc did not invent the hamburger or the drive through or franchising, but he's the one who put it all together in a magic formula. Ray Kroc built the centralized training facility that came to be known as Hamburger University, where franchisees get indoctrinated. It was Kroc who pioneered franchise agreements with multiple quality control mechanisms built in. McDonald's would monitor quality via surprise inspections and secret shoppers. And if a franchise was falling behind on quality or just not adhering to corporate policy or whatever, well, then McDonald's could withdraw their franchise. They could take back the right that they bestow upon someone else to run a McDonald's restaurant in the style of McDonald's, thus effectively putting that franchisee out of business. And Kroc made his money by taking a percent of total sales instead of just selling the milkshake machine for a one-time fee or whatever. This provided Kroc with an ongoing cash flow and it made him invested in the success of the franchisees working under him. Remember that in the beginning, Kroc was himself a franchisee, but he was like a, a territory operator like the Dairy Queen guys. So other franchisees worked underneath him. If you saw the movie, The Founder, you probably remember the big scene between Michael Keaton as Ray Kroc and uh, B.J. Novak from The Office as Harry Sonneborn, a vice president at Tasty Freeze, who in the movie says to Michael Keaton, look, you're not in the burger business, you're in the real estate business. And he convinces Michael Keaton to start buying up sites that are suitable for a McDonald's location, and then he would sell or lease those properties to the franchisee. Thus, Ray Kroc would become the franchisor and the landlord. So he'd get the franchise fee as well as rent for as long as that franchise operated. To this day, real estate accounts for most of McDonald's assets. This scene in the movie is basically accurate from what I can gather, and what became known as the Sonneborn model where the franchisor owns the real estate that came to dominate the entire fast food industry because it just makes so much money for the franchisor. Ray Kroc and Harry Sonneborn bought out the McDonald brothers and became the company. You know, they went from being a franchisee themselves to being the franchisor in chief. And they were able to do that in part because they owned the ground on which their franchisees stood. Here's the rosy way of looking at it from the franchisee's perspective. Say you're a prospective McDonald's franchisee. 
all you've got is a bank loan and a dream. The franchise model, as originally conceived, was designed to exploit the local knowledge that the franchisee has about their own community. Traditionally, the local franchisee would have the best idea of where to locate, for example. But as this business professionalized, eggheads with traffic maps at McDonald's corporate in Illinois really did acquire superior knowledge of where to best site a McDonald's in pretty much any community. So they could make better decisions than the local franchisee. Plus, if corporate took care of the location, then the franchisee wouldn't have to worry about real estate stuff. They could just focus on managing their restaurant, which is legit a very big job. That's the rosy way of looking at it from the franchisee's perspective. Here's the cynical way of looking at it. By becoming the landlord... Fast food companies like McDonald's and their imitators close the noose around their franchisees' necks. Corporate controlled everything about the franchisees' business. The look, the menu, the price, the service, the physical plant and or the land underneath it. This turned the franchisee into an employee of the company in every way except in the management of risk. It's the franchisee who ultimately holds the financial risk, the debt or the sunk investment costs associated with their location. If the restaurant fails, it's the franchisee who loses their shirt. The franchisor, on the other hand, pocketed all of those franchise fees and rent payments. And even though the restaurant failed, the land is still good. And corporate can turn around and sell or lease that land to somebody else, perhaps a different McDonald's operator who might do better in that location. This model of overbearing paternal franchising allowed franchisors to outsource risk to the little guy while pocketing most of the rewards. Because imagine how much of a restaurant's revenue goes to rent. Is that why the U.S. government almost banned franchising circa 1970? Well, no. As bad as McDonald's was and is, franchising can be even more exploitative and irresponsible. Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario. Let's imagine that I, Adam Ragusea, let's imagine that I want to parlay my internet micro-celebrity into a restaurant chain. But I, won't, I don't want to do any work or take on any financial risk or really do anything of any actual value. I just want to start up, scale up, and cash out, as they say. So what do I do? I go out and I find some vulnerable Adam Ragusea super fans who want to franchise my restaurant concept. I tell them I have a brilliant business plan that can't lose, though I'm light on specifics, and I get them to sign a franchise agreement with me where they pay an enormous fee up front. Maybe I tell them the upfront fee to me is, gonna, is really big, but you know the ongoing fees with me are going to be small. So hey, it'll all balance out over time. Those vulnerable superfans go to their local banks and get business loans with their houses and their cars as collateral or whatever. And they pay me my exorbitant one-time franchise fee. And at that point, I have a few options. I could put all of these fees into my new Swiss bank account and abscond to some sunny locale that doesn't have an active extradition treaty with the U.S. Maybe Crimea. I don't know. That's one option I have. I could just sell franchise fees for a restaurant concept that doesn't really exist, or maybe it's just terrible, and I can run off with the profits to the next town full of suckers. This is what we call a fly-by-night operation. Another option, if I just want to get rich quick with no care for ethics, another option is that I could sell franchises for exorbitant one-time fees which on paper would make it look like my company has enormous revenue. 
Never mind that those were one-time fees, so this revenue stream is completely unsustainable. But before anybody catches up to that reality, all I got to do is sell my company to some deep-pocketed but deeply stupid buyer. Or I could sell it on a stock market, and a stock market is like one gigantic, deep-pocketed, deeply stupid buyer. I pump up my initial public offering by highlighting my revenue, which I know is purely temporary, but stock buyers don't really know that. I sell a bunch of stock and then I abscond. Legally this time, because it is not necessarily illegal to sell a terrible stock to gullible people. I mean, there are investment disclosure laws and all that, but good lawyers can work around those. I just sell my worthless company as stock and I whistle my way to the bank. I give my franchisees a worthless business plan with no training, no supply, no support. Their businesses fail and they lose their homes or whatever they used as collateral to get their business loans and the stockholders see their share prices go to zero. And that's that. I laugh all the way to Bermuda or whatever because I sold my stock a long time ago. This kind of thing happened in the Wild West days of franchising, which was basically the 1950s and 60s. Consider the case of Minnie Pearl's Chicken. Minnie Pearl was a character actor from the Grand Ole Opry and Hee Haw. In the late 60s, Nashville entrepreneur and professional crank about town John J. Hooker got to Minnie Pearl and he got her to give her her name to a chain of chicken restaurants he would launch to challenge Kentucky Fried Chicken. They basically did what I just described as option number two. They sold a bunch of franchise agreements for big upfront fees that they recorded on their books as income on the day of signing, and this made it look like they were going to make way more money than they actually were because these big fees were one-time fees, and they rushed the company public based on these deceptively great earnings reports. They sold a bunch of stock way above its real value, and at that point, the chain could live or die for all the founders cared, and Minnie Pearl's chicken unsurprisingly failed. Minnie Pearl was a celebrity, So there was a big public scandal and an investigation in which the Securities and Exchange Commission eventually cleared Pearl and Hooker of having done anything illegal, but they were still fly-by-night artists and had been exposed as such in the public eye, to the point where pumping up your initial stock offering based on one-time franchise fees with little, if any, actual underlying business, this became known as mini pearling it. Mini pearling it. Oh, you heard about you heard about that guy who's doing a new burger chain in the Southwest? That guy is totally mini pearling it. They're going to be out of business in a year. So the public and the politicians representing the public started to form a narrative about franchising, a narrative in this context, meaning a story that somebody tells themselves accurate or not. The narrative about franchising was that it was a pyramid scheme. Really, any business that sells you the ability to do business yourself could easily be a pyramid scheme. Colleges and universities might be pyramid schemes. A graduate program that produces PhDs whose only career prospects are to teach graduate programs to produce other PhDs whose only career prospects are to teach graduate programs, etc. Hey, that's a pyramid scheme you got there, Dean. The U.S. public in the late 60s thought of franchise agreements as a way for the big guy to take advantage of the little guy. A slick-talking huckster makes a bunch of big promises about the American dream and whatnot and then flies off with a big bag of cash while mom and pop are stuck with a worthless store and a crushing debt to their local business bank. Legislators and courts were looking to get tough on franchisor abuses. And that's how we got the case of Chicken Delight. Chicken Delight was a fried chicken chain originating in, you guessed it, Illinois. It was founded the same year as KFC, but 
it was a much more traditional recipe compared to KFC's chicken. KFC's whole thing was the Colonel's patented pressure fryer that produced incredibly juicy meat in a fraction of the time. But because of all of the moisture that's trapped under the airtight pressure lid, the skin is not terribly crunchy. Chicken Delight chicken was fried the normal homestyle way in an open vessel, an open kettle, if you will. A commenter on my last episode argued that Open Kettle, the original name of Dunkin' Donuts, would have referred to any large frying vessel with no lid to distinguish it from like a, you know, a coffee or tea kettle. When you fry without a lid, you allow moisture to escape and you can get much crispier breading on your chicken. KFC introduced its extra crispy chicken in 1972 specifically to counter the competition from Chicken Delight. But while other franchisers took steps to ensure quality control over their franchisees, Chicken Delight didn't, really. Nor did they charge a big upfront fee, which is good, I guess. The way they made money was they sold the equipment and the packaging and the batter mixes and such to the franchisees. That doesn't seem like a terrible business model to me. At least corporate is still invested in the franchisee's success that way, right? Because like the more product the franchisee sells, the more ingredients and more paper cups and stuff they buy from corporate. Plus a small additional markup on those supplies that the corporate added to help pay for their centralized advertising and operations and such. Chicken Delight was not a very well-run franchise network, and lots of stores struggled and failed, and this naturally resulted in recriminations and lawsuits. One group of spurned Chicken Delight franchisees filed a class action suit alleging that Chicken Delight had violated U.S. antitrust law, you know, anti-monopoly law. They violated that law by tying franchise eligibility to an agreement to buy ingredients and supplies at a higher than market price. Because remember, Chicken Delight Corporate funded itself by attaching an extra fee to all of the supplies they sold to the franchises. The spurned franchisees won in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California. The decision effectively broke all of Chicken Delight's franchise agreements and probably lots of other franchise agreements. Some Chicken Delight locations kept going independently under sound-alike names like Chicken Tonight, but Consolidated Foods, which was the corporate parent of Chicken Delight, which later became Sarah Lee, by the way, they were done after Siegel versus Chicken Delight, and they gave up on the brand, totally. A successful franchisee of many Chicken Delights around Winnipeg, oh, I'm sorry, Chicken's Delight around Winnipeg, that guy named uh, Otto Koch bought what remained of Chicken Delight in Canada, and the Canadians remain delighted by said chicken to this very day. But the chain is dead in the U.S. because of an arguably overzealous reactionary ruling from the Ninth Circuit the Court of Appeals that was subsequently effectively overturned by later Supreme Court decisions. This is the environment that Dunkin' Donuts founder Bill Rosenberg was living in when he and other franchise industry bigwigs founded the International Franchise Association to advocate for the interests of franchisors, not franchisees, mind you. They could have called it the International Franchisor Association, but that would have said the quiet part out loud, so... They called it the International Franchise Association to imply that they advocated on behalf of franchisees as well as franchisors, which, of course, they really didn't because no one could. And who was the first president of the IFA? Al Tunick, the guy who started Chicken Delight. In fairness to the IFA's founders... They say that the whole reason they built the organization was to work out a set of ethics for franchisers to follow so that the industry could self-regulate before the government stepped in to regulate them. And that is basically what happened. Industry codes of ethics are good. IMHO. Self-regulation is good. But it was also 
lobbying efforts on the part of the IFA that killed federal legislation aimed at regulating the franchise industry. And the IFA succeeded in stopping or watering down similar legislation at the state level in many cases. The Federal Trade Commission ultimately enacted much of what that federal legislation would have done anyway. The FTC simply adopted rules under its pre-existing statutory authority, and these rules require that franchisors disclose a ton of information to franchisees. And for example, and I reckon that's a very good thing. The IFA went on to lobby against pretty much every piece of pro-worker employment legislation considered over the last 70 years in the United States, like raises in the minimum wage. I think that kind of sucks. But I don't think that I am opposed to the franchise model of restauranting, at least not in principle. Franchising is, like so many other facets of modern life, a mechanism of institutionalized mediocrity which is both a good and bad thing. Because, you know, we used to have lots of bad food and a little good food. Now, with chains, we mostly have a bunch of mediocre food. And you could say the same thing about the jobs that people have now, thanks to franchising. But I'll tell you, there's a new Dairy Queen here in Knoxville on Kingston Pike near Westtown Mall, Knoxville, Tennessee, just opened a few months ago, and it seems to be a like family-owned franchise with multiple generations working in the store. The older daughter is such a badass on the drive-through intercom. She is like an air traffic controller, totally in control of the chaos. And these folks clearly have the pride and purpose of owners something you could never get out of even the best paid employee. These folks, I reckon, are owners and they have pride in the food. I got this cheeseburger from that Dairy Queen the other day that I just had to put on Instagram because it was so beautiful. It's like how the burger in the commercial looks, but real. I love Dairy Queen. And I don't think that franchising a Dairy Queen or even working at a Dairy Queen has to be a soulless, low-status slog. To me, Dairy Queen is now a rich American culinary tradition. And I'm really glad to see these folks upholding that tradition with particularly high standards and keeping it going. That's the best of what franchising can be. But here's the sobering statistic with which lawyer William Killian ends his obviously pro-franchise legal history of franchising. He ends by quoting from a 2005 book called The Economics of Franchising by a couple of well-regarded economists. These economists wrote, quote, The notion that franchising poses substantially fewer business risks for franchisees than starting an independent business, this is not supported by the data. In other words, franchises fail at about the same rate as comparable independent businesses. So keep that in mind before you sign away your life to a franchiser. You are not buying a sure thing. Of course, you are buying a sure thing when you tuck into an episode of the Adam Ragusea podcast because it's free and I make absolutely no promise of delivering anything of value. I hope, but I don't promise. I hope this ep was valuable to you. Make good choices. Next time we'll talk to you about uh, something other than fast food. Talk to you next time.